So let me tell you a little bit more about tonight's guest. Um, so Shaw has a history of innovation that began in 1925. Shaw transformed a passion for making great microphones and audio electronics into an obsession, which has set an industry standard for reliable, high quality and game changing microphones. Shaw microphones can be found in almost every studio on pretty much every stage and more and more these days at the mouths of podcasters and broadcasters worldwide. So it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by tonight's guest, Shaw's very own Jack Drury, who is here to talk to us about how to get the best audio for your podcast. Hi, Jack. How are you doing? Hello, Rob. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Really excited to get into this presentation. No, great stuff. Great stuff. So you've been on a show this week, I hear. We've been doing Plaza. If anybody has also been at Plaza, please do let me know in the chat. You might have seen me hanging out there with the Shaw booth. I was representing Shaw talking about uh, touring and festivals at Plaza. So this is quite a nice little change for me this week. And I've got my mint tea. It was a little bit of a Larry one. Uh, <laughs> but we're... we're you know what these trade shows can be like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, it's three long days. Yeah, <laughs> Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. But because I'm doing this, I got out of the loadout. So, you know. Excellent. <laughs> actually, last time we saw you in the flesh was actually at the podcast show back in May, wasn't it? Um, how, how did you find that? Did you enjoy the show? Podcast show was brilliant. I was really um, surprised at how well attended it was. And also the, the types of people that attended as well. It was a really interesting mix of people. Some, you know, people with very established podcasts, a lot of very established podcast producers, some people just starting out. And what I found quite interesting was across that broad spectrum of people, everybody kind of had the same sorts of questions, which is really, really interesting. So, you know, I think a lot of the stuff that we're going to address today is pertinent for people who are just starting out and people who've been doing it for years. You know, there's a, there's a huge amount of information out there. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot that people feel like they should really care about and actually probably don't need to worry too much about. So, yeah. What did you think of it? You, you had a stand, didn't you? I mean, yeah. So we had a stand. It was our, our first time doing it. Obviously, it was the first time that they did the show. I think it was postponed because of COVID. But actually, because of that, I think it kind of worked to the advantage in the end that they had so much time to build up this, this mammoth show with all these amazing, amazing exhibitors. So we had a great time and we're going to be back next year. So yeah, it's uh, something that, that we hope we can go back to again. And yeah, it's just nice for us to get, especially with the, the, this webinar tonight, to, to learn a little bit more about the podcasters and the, the podcasting community. And, you know, we we delve into it a bit, but there's always more that we can learn. And yeah, so having you on tonight to talk about podcasting is our first podcast-based webinar. So yeah. Fantastic. Should be I'm really exciting excited. times for us. <laughs> um, so um, before we go any further, um, Jack actually presented at one of our live events this time last year. Um, it was called Back to Live, and it was a joy to listen and share your wealth of knowledge. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I won't keep you any longer, and I'll just pass over to you to do your thing. And I'll see you all in a little while. Jack Drew, everybody. Fantastic. Thanks, Rob. I'm going to share my screen, uh, and then I'm going to put my PowerPoint into presentation mode. And both of those things have gone very well which is good, so we can kick off. Um, this presentation is quite concise, quite succinct. Um, it shouldn't be a huge amount of time, and that means there'll be lots of time for questions. So please do ask any questions. We will do them at the end. There's gonna be tons of time for it. And there are no silly questions. There aren't even really any silly answers. I think anything that you might be thinking about asking it is gonna help other people on this uh, as well. Um, the other thing that I just wanna, kind of start off by saying is we've tried to make this presentation as brand agnostic as we can. So, you know, this information is going to be relevant to you if you're using products from our competitors or anything of that nature, except in three very specific places. And I will tell you when we get to those three very specific places uh, as we get to them in the presentation. And actually, the first slide is one of those um, <laughs> bits where it is very, very short centric. So, I mean, Rob has done a fantastic job of giving you the background of the company. I just want to expand a little bit on some of those things. We call ourselves the most trusted audio brand. We've been doing it longer than anybody else. Our company is 95 years old, started in America. Shaw is still a privately run business. We're basically set up like a charitable trust. So there is a board of, of trustees. We have a, an amazing CEO called Chris Shavink. The company was passed to Chris Shavink uh, by Rose Shaw, who was the last CEO, who was the wife of Sydney Shaw, who started the company. 
And Sydney Shaw was very, very passionate about audio. We we're very lucky to employ some really good engineers at the very, very start of our company, one in particular called Ben Bauer, who designed the SM58, which you all know and love. Uh, and since then, we have been a mainstay in festivals, concert touring, theatre. We are now um, big in podcasting and video casting. We are also very big in internet, uh, sorry, we are very big in um, kind of video call situations, this type of thing. We make a number of products that go into banks and building societies and big boardrooms and things of that nature. Anything with audio is what we're very good at. And yeah, we're very excited to be celebrating our 100th birthday very, very soon. Watch out for that. It's going to be some exciting things coming up. So there we go. That's sure. Let's talk about podcasting. So the way that we've broken this presentation down is basically the three things that you're going to want to think about when it comes to selecting your setup and your microphone. And then we'll talk a little bit about processing and stuff like that afterwards as well. But the first thing that you'll come across if you're on the Studio Spares website and you're looking at what podcasting microphone to use is probably the type of mic connection that you're going to have. So there are two really, really common mic connections that you'll find for podcast microphones. And the first is the XLR microphone connection. So the XLR is an industry standard audio connection. Any kind of audio for live performance or anything really is probably going to have an XLR in there at some point. This was standardized many, many years ago. We like it for several reasons. We can run XLR cables over huge, huge distances without any signal loss. We can connect them together to make our runs longer, which makes life really good. When it comes to podcasting, XLR microphones are great because they allow us to use multiple devices together. So if you're going to go podcasting with a few friends, you will just need to get an audio interface with enough channels in it, the, micro the number of microphones that you'll need and some XLR cable, and you're there, you're podcasting, you're able to plug that into your computer and get going straight away. So this is really, really good option for anybody. And, you know, XLR microphones are ubiquitous. You can find lots and lots of them. We'll talk about the different types a bit later on. The second microphone connection that you will find is the USB microphone connection. Now, this has become really popular over the last sort of 10 years. We like USB microphones because they interface with digital devices very, very easily. So you can buy one product, which is the microphone and the audio interface all built into one, plug your USB bus into your computer and you will be able to use a DAO that will be able to see that microphone and you can start recording with it straight away. So it's a really streamlined and easy setup. Now, the downside with this is that USB microphones only offer a one-to-one -one connection. So you will only really be able to record yourself podcasting. Now, this is great if you're planning to do it on a video call, like on Zoom. There are some really cool bits of software like Soundtrack and Riverside that help you along in that way. Um, but if you're going to go podcasting with some friends, if there's going to be two or three of you, this setup doesn't really work. Now, there is a little bit of misinformation, I would say, out there on like Reddit forums and Facebook forums and stuff like that, that you can make multiple USB devices work together by creating something called an aggregate device in your machine. Now, that's a really complicated process. And the problem with it is you can do it and it will work up until the point that it doesn't work. And there'll be a number of reasons why your computer will look at that setup and suddenly get confused. We can't really like IP address those microphones. So they will move around in different places in the system depending on what's going on. And your input and output routings will get confused within the machine and the whole thing will just not work. So it is not something that we advise doing. Um, if you are going to be doing my uh, podcasting with several people, the XLR microphone, sorry, yeah, the XLR microphone is definitely the correct way to go. So there we go, USB microphone, XLR microphone, which one are we gonna pick? We've got some ideas about that now. Let's talk about the next thing that you'll find when surfing the studio's there's website, which is the type of microphone. And again, there are lots of different types of microphones, but there are two really common ones that you'll find when it comes to this specific subject. The first one is the condenser microphone. So, you know, these will look like studio microphones, some people call them. There's lots of other kind of ways of, of describing them. Generally, they are larger devices. They are slightly more expensive devices. We manufacture them. Lots of other companies do as well. And there's a few really useful things about these microphones when it comes to doing a podcast. 
The first one is that they're loud. So we have to power these microphones using something called phantom power, 48 volts down the XLR cable um, to, to give us power on that diaphragm. And that means that what comes out of the back of this is, is a very loud signal. So you can use a kind of cheaper setup, a cheaper audio interface. You don't have to use a nice preamp or anything of that nature because the microphone is going to be doing a lot of work for you just based on the fact that it's powering itself and, and, and it's working in that way. These microphones are also really sensitive. So when it comes to, you know, the kind of plosives and the nice bits of our, you know, the way that our voices sound, they're very, very sensitive to those things. So if you set these up in the right way, these will deliver you excellent sounding voice recordings for, you know, voiceovers, speech and podcasting as well. Now, manufacturers really like condenser microphones because they have what's known as a low mass capsule design. What does that mean? It means the actual bit of the microphone that's doing the work is very small. We can build it into all sorts of different things and, and make it look different and work in different ways. So that means most of the USB microphones that you will come across are probably going to have a condenser capsule in them because we can put it into a smaller enclosure. We can do different things with it. Um, and we offer, you know, most of our USB portfolio, for example, will be a condenser based capsule. There is a problem with condenser microphones, though, and that is the sensitivity that they have does mean that if you are recording in a room that doesn't sound great, if it's a bit echoey or something like that, these microphones are going to pick that up very quickly and it's not going to sound very professional. So, you know, if you're going podcasting in a space like I'm in now, really, with lots of reflective surfaces, these microphones are going to need a lot of work to sound good. The other, other, the other thing to bear in mind with these is um, cheaper condenser microphones from you know, various manufacturers have a lot of self noise. You know, these are active devices, we're powering them. And there is a kind of cost ratio thing when it comes to how much you spend on a condenser microphone and how good it sounds. Cheaper condenser microphones will have a lot of hiss because the components uh, are generating a lot of self noise. So this is something to bear in mind. Again, you can kind of get rid of that with a bit of processing. Um, but you know, it is a drawback with this specific type of microphone. So just to recap very quickly, condenser microphones, great because they're loud and very sensitive and sound awesome, but they are not great when it comes to recording in, in difficult spaces and they do carry a price tag for the quality as well. So the other type of microphone that we will find is a dynamic microphone. Now this is a much more familiar thing for many of us. The SM58, the SM57 that we can see here are dynamic microphone capsules. And when it comes to using these for podcasting, there are a couple of things about them that make them really, really good. The first is they have zero self noise. These are not active devices. We are generating the audio using a magnetic field rather than powering the microphone, right? So immediately you're gonna get a massive signal to noise ratio with any dynamic microphone that you purchase. And like an SM58, for example, is 99 quid. So you're already getting a really good sound with no noise at a very, very low price point. So if price is a massive thing for you, dynamic microphones are gonna get you to where you need to be for much less money. The other great thing about these is they have a very focused and directional sound. So unlike condensed microphones that are kind of sensitive to everything in the room, a dynamic microphone, you can point it at the thing that you want to record and it to a greater or lesser extent is just going to listen and record that specific thing. So yeah, SM57, SM58 make great podcasting microphones um, and they're super cheap as well. This is the second point in the presentation where we get a bit shore centric and we do need to talk about the SM7B, which is kind of its own thing. This microphone was actually developed to replace condenser microphones in American broadcast studios is what we wanted to do with it back in the 1980s, back in the 1980s. And it kind of didn't work. There was, because it is a dynamic microphone in nature, a lot of the radio presenters were saying, well, I'm going to have to have it super close to my face and I don't want that. I kind of want it tucked away over there. And it sat in our portfolio for a bit and didn't do very much. And we very nearly discontinued it. But for various reasons, this microphone became the darling of the podcast industry. And it is a shape that you will recognize immediately from things like Diary of the CEO, the Joe Rogan podcast. Loads of people are using these for podcasts and for video casts as well. Why is that? What makes this so good as a podcasting microphone? Well, 
SM7B has the sensitivity of a condenser microphone. So all of that nice kind of top end detail is present in this, in this unit, but we have the focus of a dynamic microphone. So if you are recording in a space that doesn't sound great, an SM7B is gonna give you some of those condenser characteristics without the drawbacks, which is fantastic. Now, there is a drawback with the SM7B that is not related to the sound. Basically, because we get that condenser um, we get that condenser performance in the acoustic environment that we build it into and the types of electronics that we're using. We've got a humbucking voice coil in here. There's a lot going on in that unit. Even though it is a dynamic microphone, it does require a professional preamp to work properly. So if you take this and plug it into a cheap entry level audio interface, it's not gonna sound very good. So you will need to use a really good audio interface with a good preamp or an inline JFET. So an inline JFET, they're sometimes referred to by the brand names. You know, you've got things like cloud lifters that a lot of people will recommend these with FET heads. Studio Spares actually make their own inline JFET, which is really, really good. All that an inline JFET does, you give it phantom power and it just increases the um, amount of volume in your circuit, clean. So it is like 19 or 22 de decibels of clean gain, which is what these microphones need. And as soon as you do that, it opens up, you get that condenser-like performance and that dynamic focus, and it is the best podcasting sound that you will ever, ever have. But it is essential that you do that. So if you're gonna use this with a cheap audio interface, get an inline JFET or get a, a more expensive interface with the, with the correct amount of headroom in the preamp to make it work properly. Okay, we've talked a lot about microphones now. We've got our connector types, we've got our microphone diaphragm types. The third thing that you really have to consider, we've touched on it a little bit, is the recording space that you are in. So there are certain things that you can do to make the recording space sound very good. You want to try and find a room with a lot of soft furnishings. So things like sofas, pillows, beds, those sort of things absorb sound really nicely. So that's something that's definitely worth trying to include in your podcasting space if you can. You want to avoid reflective surfaces. So actually, the space that I'm in now isn't perfect for podcasting by any means. I keep meaning to get some acoustic tiles in here to deaden the sound down a little bit. And it's worth bearing in mind that putting acoustic panels in any room is going to transform it. Any room can become dead and, you know, really good for podcasting by using acoustic panels. Studio Spares actually did an excellent video of this, um, and I definitely recommend going to watch it. You can hear the difference in it. It sounds fantastic. So, yeah, those are the things to look out for. You know, don't use a wooden floor, have carpets, all that sort of stuff. Really, really good for finding a good podcasting space. So there we go. Spoken about all the basic stuff. If you're just going to start out, the right type of connection, the right type of diaphragm. What about processing? If we need to take that audio to the next level to get it sounding really professional, what processing do we need to use? Now, there's a huge amount of content about this online. There's loads of videos about processing for podcast audio. I personally think a lot of it actually is thinking about it too much. We don't want to spend hours in the box editing and you know kind of putting compressors in and stuff like that because that's time that you want to spend podcasting or promoting your podcast or doing stuff like that so what i've done here is basically pick a few things that are really really useful to have um, the first one that's definitely useful to have is a good denoise plugin. So this is the one that i use this is called rx voice denoise from isotope uh, if you get it on like a Black Friday type or a, or a Labor Day that they have in America type situation. It is super, super cheap. And to be totally open about it, I don't know what most of the controls in this plugin do. I just mount it, it's the first thing in my signal chain and I turn it on and it sounds great and I leave it. I don't ever touch anything else. I'm sure that the lovely people from Isotope can give you more information about it, uh, but I just tend to put it on and leave it. And that's what I'd recommend that you do too. There are lots of other kind of denoiser plugins out there, but this one is the easiest to use and, and it really does sound very good. And if you are podcasting in a noisy space or you've got you know a lot of noise in, in the kind of, in, in the print to track, so to speak, this transforms it immediately. So it's definitely, definitely something worth having. The second thing that you're going to want to look at is a bit of EQ. Now, my God, there is so much debate about how to EQ for vocals. It's mad. Like you can do a whole university course just on this thing. Personally, I think there's only really two things that you want to do. And I've demonstrated them here in this picture. So the first is a low cut. All that's going to do is get rid of the energy in the bottom end of our recording. It's useless to us. We don't want it. There's just rubbish in there, like cars going past and helicopters and all that sort of stuff. Uh, again, loads of debate about where you put that cut. Should it be 100 hertz? Should it be 250 hertz? 
I just put it in at 100 and leave it. I think that you can really think about that too much if you're not careful, which is why I recommend that you do. And the second area in this EQ that's worth looking at is this kind of two to six K zone, which I've highlighted here for you. Now, this is really important for vocals because that's where all the good stuff for speech intelligibility lives. What does speech intelligibility mean? That's basically when you can hear that somebody is talking and then you understand what they're saying, right? So this two to six K zone carries all of the starts of words and the plosives and the T's and the, you know, information about how I'm modulating my voice. That is a really key zone for your brain to demodulate and then kind of process it. So you can put a bit of a boost in here if you like. Uh, I wouldn't recommend going too far, just a couple of decibels in this zone, find a frequency that kind of sounds good. But if you've selected the right type of microphone, it's going to be working in this space for you anyway. So, you know, it's just something to bear in mind if you are really finding it hard to understand what your guest or what your, your you know, kind of printed track, what they're saying, which is a weird kind of phenomenon that does absolutely happen. Have a little look at this two to six K zone and maybe put a little bit of a boost in here if you feel like it needs it. So that's EQ. Um, the third thing that you're going to want to put in your chain, and this is the order that I would do it in, by the way. So voice denoise first, then an EQ. The third thing that you want to look at is compression. Now, compression is a whole subject in and of itself. We could do a complete, you know, webinar on, on just compressors. Um, and they are, you know, if you don't really know how to use them, you can ruin your track with it. Uh, but if you know, if you use them correctly, if you put the right kind of work into them, they can really, really sound good. All that a compressor does is reduce the dynamic range of our audio. So if you record somebody naturally, there's going to be lots of loud bits. There's going to be some bits where they're a bit quiet. And our brain actually compresses audio naturally, right? Part of the processing that the brain does, it has a little inbuilt compressor that just takes that dynamic range out. It turns out if you don't have compressed kind of fake audio that's being played back, our brain has to work really, really hard to put that processing back in. It's a weird kind of perception thing. So by putting a compressor in your signal chain, it's going to do a lot of work for you and allow your listeners to have a much more relaxed time and not have like ear fatigue and stuff like that. When it comes to using compressors for podcasting, there are only two controls that you really need to worry about, right? The first one is the threshold control, which you can see on the uh, kind of top left here of the, of the unit that we've selected. This just says when the compressor kicks in, right? So what point is the audio too loud and is it going to start reducing the volume? The second uh, is the makeup control or the gain control. And all that's doing is if you do compress a little bit, um, you're going to reduce the volume of your track. So you'll want to put a little bit of gain back into it. And the meter that we use to decide how much gain to put back in uh, is the meter on the compressor itself. And what I would recommend that you do is look to be getting around about minus five dB of compression on average across your whole track. And that would mean that you then add five dB back into the makeup gain at the other end. Um, Use an easy compressor, right? This is actually quite a complicated compressor. This is the standard compressor in Logic. You can buy lots of really good compressors from Waves and stuff like that. One knob compressors are awesome, which is just like how much compression is taking place and then it will figure it out for you. Having a little bit of compression in your podcast audio track is a really, really good thing to do and, and makes it sound much more professional very, very quickly. This is kind of where that BBC Radio 4 good stuff lives. Um, there we go. The last thing to talk about is your recording and your mixing levels. And this is a really important one. So what I see quite a lot is people report recording their podcasts and the levels are super low. So if we take this meter, for an example, the level might be at like minus 30 dB, which is halfway up the control on average. Now, if you're going to export your podcast at that sort of volume, when you upload it to your you know, platform of choice, be it Spotify or Apple Podcasts or something like that, it's going to try and increase the sound, normalize the sound of that audio so that your listening community will enjoy a vaguely average volume across all the podcasts that they have. So if your audio is super quiet, Spotify is going to normalize that and it's a really harsh normalizer that they use and try and increase the volume of it and make it sound good. Um, my kind of rule of averages that I teach people is your individual tracks when you're mixing your individual microphones, you want them to be 
happily in the green zone and just peeking into the yellow zone. So on this meter, yellow kind of kicks in at about minus 12 dB. And we can see here that that's where my peaks are going. So that's a really good mix volume. And then when it comes to your master bus, so all the mix tracks together, we can see that on the right hand side here, you want that to end up where everything in average is in the yellow and we get a little bit of peaking happening in the red. So around about minus nine dB is a good place for all of your audio to be sitting on average. So they're the only four things really that you want to look at. Now, if you are, this is the third bit of sure kind of centric stuff that we can look at. If you are doing some podcasting and you want to do some processing, but you don't want to get involved in all this stuff, then I would definitely recommend taking a look at the MV7 podcast microphone. So this is a microphone that we developed specifically for podcasting. This has a denoiser, an EQ, a compressor, and an auto level control built into the microphone itself. And not just that, this actually has the benefits of a USB and an XLR microphone because it has both connections. So you can plug this in to your laptop and just do a recording uh, using the inbuilt interface. But if you're going to go and do podcasting with a load of other people, we have an XLR output on this microphone as well that is independent that you can use. So it really covers both of those bases. And it's kind of riffing on the SM7B thing. You can tell from the look, this is a dynamic microphone, but what's really nice is it has that kind of SM7B sound, that sensitivity, but we don't need the level of gain that the SM7B requires to sound good. So you can use this microphone with a cheaper audio interface without the need of a FET head, and it will sound really, really good. So in terms of the processing in it, there's two modes. We have an app, which you know, allows you to control this stuff. The first mode is the manual mode. So in this mode, you can choose how much gain the microphone has. You can set a little EQ curve. You can kind of see here the stuff that I was talking about, that low cut, that you know, bumper around two to six K. You can select those in the microphone and you can say how much compression you want. So you can say a little bit of light compression or medium compression or really heavy compression. And that's the only controls that are there, which is everything that you need to make it sound really good for podcasting. The second mode that you can run this in, and this is what I do because I'm super lazy, is the auto mode. And in auto mode, you just say where the microphone is and what kind of tone you want, and it's going to do everything. It will do all the denoise, all the auto level, everything built into the microphone itself really efficiently. And that's actually what you're listening to right now. So I'm using an MV7 to do this um, webinar in the auto mode in exactly this setup, as you can see, it's far and it's a natural sound. You can make a darker sound, which is a bit more SM7B, and you can make a brighter sound, which is a bit more condensory, depending on what you want to do. So this is definitely something that I would look at. And it's worth mentioning as well, as part of being on this webinar, I think there's going to be a draw to win one of these microphones as well. So I'll let Rob kind of go through the details of that when we throw back to him. One question that I get a lot when I do these types of sessions is how can I get better? You know, I've just started out podcasting. I want to improve my sound. What things do I need to do to get better results and better sounding podcasts? And the answer to that is actually really simple. It's just keep making podcasts. This is one of those things that you will get better at the more that you do it. And I know a lot of producers who started out with an SM58, a Focusrite interface, and they're now using, you know, SM7Bs with uh, UA interfaces. And they've gone on that journey themselves, discovered the bits that they like, they've got their own processes. And it's just a case of learning and trying out what works for you. There are no hard and fast rules. What we presented today should just be a nice way to kind of kick things off and getting you into the right zone. But yeah, the more of it that you do, the better of it that you do. The other bit of advice that I would give is don't worry too much about all this stuff, right? You want to spend, if you're going to do podcasting, the majority of your time should be spent on writing the podcast, making the content good, marketing it, sending it to the right sorts of places. Don't get hung up on, you know, really expensive gear and being knee deep in a website, trying to find answers to all this sort of stuff. Get a microphone, get an interface, get an MV7 and go and do it and start making podcasts and you'll instantly start seeing the results come through. And that is the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And uh, yeah, I'll invite Rob to pop back on and we'll see what questions we might have had. I can see some stuff in the chat. I can see a little bit of Q&A uh, in there as well. Oh, it looks like the EOS webcam utility in the <laughs> end has uh, gone offline. So you there, there we go. Just hey. coming back now. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how many times you do this, there's always something that can go wrong. So, <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> no, brilliant, Jack. Thank you so much for that. That was excellent. It's it's oh. so thorough, and yeah, it's always a pleasure listening to you speak in these things because yeah, it's just just it's so so much important information that's easily missed. And as you said earlier, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Mm. Um, but ultimately, what is important to remember is that no matter what gear you really have, you can still make a great podcast. So, you know, absolutely. content is key and all that. Um, oh, yes. All these things could just make it better, you know. Um, so we have a lot of questions to get through, actually, and a load mm. that were sent through before the webinar, which is always nice to see. We get more and more of those. That's that's good. Um, before we do that, just a little reminder before you all shoot off that we have got a giveaway today and also a special promotion for all of you. But you will have to stick around to the end to find out if you win. That said, um, Again, before the questions, we, as we mentioned, we run a little poll um, at the beginning of the webinar just to gauge sort of where all of you are at in your, your podcast careers and journeys. Um, so actually, only 13% of people said that they currently had a podcast, where 47% said they were thinking about it. Um, so that's very interesting for us to just see sort of where you are at and, you know, if you're beginners or you have a lot of knowledge about it but haven't actually actioned on that yet or, you know. So, you know yeah. what? I, I would fall into the 47%. I do a lot of podcasting for, for sure, you know, as a guest in something like this. And I do a lot of podcast producing as well, you know, kind of on the side. Uh, but I am in that 47% of I, I have thought about doing my own podcast. I have lots of ideas, but uh, I don't, you know, I haven't quite bitten the bullet yet. So I should probably take <laughs> my own advice and do it. <laughs> That's it. I mean, there's there's so many podcasts out there, isn't it? It's try, it's hard to find your your niche as well. Like you know, mm -hmm. to find that that one key subject that really sort of separates you apart. But that's also not that important to some degree. I think if if you're interested in podcasting and you want to get into it, that that's the main important thing. It's just give it a go and see how you get on. And you know, you, it's a learning process, as you said. Just keep making podcasts. It's it just get trying, and you'll learn along the way. Yeah, precisely. Um, so questions then, um, in absolutely no particular order, just as in the order that I've been providing by Mike over there. Um, so you may have covered some of this already, but it's, it's just good to sort of reiterate a few points. Um, so let's start with this one. Um, I have a Shaw SM58. I understand that it's more of a vocal mic for singers, but is it okay to use for podcasts? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the SM58 is, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, uh, an insider knowledge, which I, I think I'm allowed to give. I'm, I'm sure that everybody probably, you know, understands this, actually. And we, we, we're very, very proud about the fact that the capsule in the SM58 and the SM7B and the SM57 is actually exactly the same, right? So the story of the SM58 is a guy called Ben Bauer drew the diagram for it, drew the circuit diagram for it in about 1928, I think. And we then sat on it for a number of years and then we released it and it became a really, really good. It was the first microphone of its type to hit the market and it was used for everything, you know, live performance, studio performances. And that diaphragm, that capsule design, the Unidyne 3, which is ultimately what it became, you will find it in the 58, you'll find it in the 57, you'll find it in the SM7B. The question that then comes up is, well, why the price jump to SM7B? What's going on there? And it's all about the acoustic environment that we build these things into. So a 58 and a 57 have slightly different acoustic characteristics that make one thing better for kind of percussive, you know, instrumentation and the other better for speech and vocals. The SM7B has a lot going on. You know, there's a whole acoustic chamber thing happening. There's a humbucking voice coil. And that's where the money is. That's where that kind of, you know, price jump finds itself. But to answer the question directly, SM58 is a great podcast microphone. I know loads of really professional podcasts that still use the SM58. And in fact, if you are somebody who's doing a lot of different stuff, if you're going to do some podcasting, perhaps you're also a musician and you're going to do some singing or you're going to do some sound engineering and you want one microphone that will go anywhere and do it all and sound really good, an SM58 is a fantastic option. It, it's specifically designed to just do everything. It's got a really, really good shock kind of mount system System inside it. Uh, the airflow design has been really optimized for speech and vocals. And that kind of bump that I was talking about, that two to 6K thing, that presence is built into how that microphone works. So out of the back, it already sounds good for all of those sorts of things. So yes, 58 best microphone that we manufacture, in my humble opinion. I love that thing. And it's only 99 quid. I mean, how much is it on the studio spares at the moment? Sorry. What we're saying, Mike, 
Uh, yeah, about 96. 96, about 96, 96 pounds. There you go, bargain. <laughs> we haven't touched the price of that microphone since the 80s. Can you believe that? Like, if we had tracked inflation, it would be 340 quid by now. But no, <laughs> we, we kept it there. It's amazing. Well, thankfully for all of us, it has stayed how it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, brilliant. Okay, so moving swiftly on. Um, okay, so this is quite a good one. Um, this is from Angela Peters. Um, I'd love to know more about recording from different locations at once. Perhaps the two podcast owners aren't at the same place and the guests might also be recording from their home or their office. Um, how can I ensure that I get the best possible sound for everyone? This is such a good question. Um, and there are two pieces of software that I would direct. What was the question's name, sorry? Uh, so this was from an Angela Peters. Angela, there's two, there's two bits of software that I would direct Angela to. The first is called Soundtrap. Now, Spotify owns Soundtrap, interestingly, and it's like a collaborative music tool is what they originally pitched it as. And the idea is it's a, it's a DAW like GarageBand or Logic, but it's hosted in the cloud, as they say. So you browse to it, you don't download it and you log in. And then I could, you know, kind of start my podcast session. They've got, I think there's a specific kind of podcast template that they have. And I can invite Rob to it. And it, it looks like a DAW, we would start recording into it. The really cool thing that it does is when you hit record, it records the audio locally at both ends, right? So it's not like clicking record on Zoom like we've done here. What, what Zoom does is, is capture the processed audio. And Zoom's doing lots of stuff, like it's compressing, it's limiting, it's taking information out. It kind of sounds a bit glitchy and digitalized just by the nature of the fact that we have to squeeze it down a fairly small pipe to get to you at home to sound good. But Soundtrap, we can still have the conversation. It kind of has Zoom functionality built into it, but the actual audio is recorded raw at either end, uploaded to the cloud, and then it's there. So that is going to sound really, really good out the back already. Um, I know that software really well. I definitely recommend looking at it. The second bit of software that I was told about recently that a lot of podcasts are now using, I think is called Riverside Audio. Yeah, that that yeah. Mentioned. They were on the podcast show, actually. They were at the podcast, so that's where I found them. And they're kind of doing the same thing. But what I'm being told is, like, there's a little bit of mucking about that you have to do to get the soundtrack stuff working well. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Claire. Riverside.fm. That's the one. Then doing our job for us. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, what I'm told is that that application, you know, does the same thing, but it's in a much more easy to use kind of fashion. So, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But that's a really, really good one to, to ask. And, and there's lots of podcasts that are now using that, and it works really well. Yeah. On that note as well, we've had a couple of various questions about, you know, how do I upload my podcast to Spotify or Apple and all these sort of things. So I, I believe that through Riverside as well, they sort of um, offer sort of information on that and, and avenues too. Um, but then on that, there's also places like there's Anchor and Buzzsprout. And that I'm, ultimately that there's there's so many out there it's a bit like music production and how do I get my music on Spotify there's there's a lot of avenues it's just I think have a good look around and do your research on to sort of each one and see what works best for you there's no sort of real right or wrong rule of thumb I don't know if you'd agree with that or, or not. I would agree with that I think the only thing that I would say is that, that kind of falls into my don't worry too much about it like you know you, you want to spend all your time when you're doing podcasting making the content good and marketing it and all that sort of stuff yeah. like you say there's so many ones out there if you know that you ultimately want your podcast to end up on Spotify then just use one that definitely has Spotify I mean Anchor yeah. would seem to me to be the most sensible option and this is the thing you can always change it like none of these things are real kind of contract focused arrangements right. right so if you decide that Anchor sucks and you want to use something else you can change later you know or visit places like the podcast show and meet other distribution kind of things and try them out so yeah i completely agree yeah definitely. okay so you mentioned usb microphones earlier um sort of pros and cons but just to elaborate a bit more on that um simon major has asked will using a usb microphone degrade my sound quality am i better using a mic with an xlr collection that's a really good question and um, from a sure Portfolio standpoint, no. We use really, really good active components in all of our USB portfolio, which is why it's a little bit more expensive. I would say if you're looking outside of that, you know, I'll take my Shaw hat off just a little bit. There's lots of really, really good USB microphones out there, actually. And I'm sure that you will know many of them and, and Studio Spares will, will sell them to you quite happily. Um, there are also some terrible ones. I mean, we see some really, really cheap USB stuff and it's just the components are really, you know, 
down to a price, they're noisy, and that will degrade the sound of your audio. So my best bit of advice on that is go for a brand that you recognize and that you have respect for. You know, if you, if you know it and they're doing good stuff, and also, you know, USB micros, bear in mind that the interface is built into the thing. So don't cheap out. You know, it's, it's not one of those situations where you can spend 30 quid on one and it's going to give you good stuff. Get a decent one, you know, get something from a good brand from, from up in the portfolio. In ours, especially on, you know, on topic of this, the, the MV7 is a great option because it has all of the really good stuff in there that we want. Uh, if you've only got 100 quid to spend, SM58 all day long, you know, be an XLR microphone, and you, you can use that with a cheaper audio interface, and it will not degrade the audio in the same way. No, that's it. I'm, I think, I hate to say it, but there's, there's a bit of an element of, you know, buy cheap, buy twice and all that, but it's not necessarily that. It's it's about buying smart as well, you know, making sure you research your product. And if, you, if you're looking around and you can't find the answers that you need, you know, there's there's a lot out there but you can always get in touch with us here at studio spares and we won't necessarily just try to sell you something we'll also hopefully offer some valuable advice of, of what what suits your setup and you know also just future proofing a little bit you know you never know what where you may go with your production be it a podcast or music or whatever but sort of making sure that you you know if you are going to keep this going that you're not just replacing it two weeks after because you realize oh i spent 20 pounds on this microphone and it wasn't quite suitable you know it's just yeah just always oh, get in touch and we've got some advice for you. Um, so here's a bit of a sort of troubleshooting question. Um, the sound on our podcast is quite echoey, but when mm. I go too close to the mic, it gets muffled and distorted. What can I do? Now, I, I'm presuming this might be based maybe around a condenser mic and maybe a sort of a, a bit of an acoustic treatment sort of realm, but any suggestions here, Jack? Probably. I mean, there, there's a few bits of information there that, you know, we're going to have to make some assumptions on. Uh, if the if the sound is distorted when you go close to it, that is because there is too much gain in that system. And actually, if you're getting a lot of echoey sound, you know, that, that would also be a, a subject to that. Like increasing the gain in a microphone increases its sensitivity. And like, you know, especially in condensed microphones and, and with SM58s, you know, dynamic microphones as well, you will get to a point where they, they become very, very sensitive. So my recommendation in this specific use case is, first of all, look at the amount of gain that you're using. Um, you know, turn the gain down if you can. There should be, you know, if you've got an audio interface, you should be able to turn that down quite happily. You don't want it distorting. You don't want it sounding in that way. If you think that your gain structure is correct, then Rob is right. You're going to want to look at the room that you're in and how echoey the room is. And like we said earlier, you can transform any space with acoustic panels. But if you don't have the budget for acoustic panels, you know, just get some soft furnishings, put some curtains up, put some pillows up, and you know, or go. This is the other thing that we, has happened since I wrote this presentation. You can go to somewhere like Pirate Studios and just rent the studio there for not very much money, and and have a really good sounding room to go and record your cop up, record your podcast in there. And there's lots of, of ways to do it. But I reckon this is a game structure problem. That's my little kind of just listening to the nature of the problem. I think you've got too much gain and you want to turn it down a bit. Yeah, that's 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 sort of what I think as well. And I mean, there's quite a few, depending on what interface and things you're using as well. Um, you know, there's there's products out there that will sort of help you a lot with your gain, you know, these sort of auto gains and things as well. So, you know, just trial and error a bit, I think maybe before you go into your podcast maybe just do a few practice recordings and just find what works for you because again there's no you need to put your gain on x with this microphone and it's going to sound crystal clear and perfect because it just doesn't work like that everyone's tonality their voice is different everyone's room is different so yeah just just have a bit of a play around and, and see what see what works um so we've had a question here about booths um Ooh. so this is from karen uh jack is a booth uh, I'm guessing a vocal booth is a, a booth or a, a vocal booth or a treated room. I imagine this is a good idea to get good audio and consistency. Yes, definitely. I mean, that's the best thing that you can do is, is get some kind of treated space together. Now I live in a very small one bedroom flat. There is no room here for me to put a vocal booth in. And I would imagine that's the case for, for lots of, of people. So then you will need to look at other things in your setup. If you're in an echoey space, dynamic microphone is, is the correct way to go. If you can put a vocal booth in, I mean, I think you guys have got a partnership with the voiceover network. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, so these are voiceover artists that literally just sit and record their voices for things all day long. And I believe that you have a vocal booth that has proved very popular with that community. 
Yeah, that's right. So we've got the Imperative Audio portable vocal booth, um, which is the idea behind that without going into a sales pitch was to create <laughs> a portable recording space that you can use that that sort of resembles the same sort of sound qualities of the pro studio or a sort of a room within a room situation. But it's something that you can have at home or in the corner of your flat or in your bedroom, but you can put it away. And that, those kind of such things are really good. I mean, but as you said, it's, you know, obviously we want you to buy affordable vocal booth. We want you to buy acoustic treatment, but we appreciate not everyone's got the same sort of budgets and not everyone can stick stuff on their walls or, or have things in their flat. So as you said, soft furnishings, all those sort of things do will help. They'll make a start. They won't be perfect, but it's certainly better than having nothing. I think in just directly answering the question, you know, what it was, will it improve the audio and will it improve the consistency? Yes, it, it will definitely. Uh, but I would say, you know, when it comes to podcasting, you don't necessarily need to have it that consistent. You can get good results in really challenging spaces by just thinking about these things in the right way. Get the right microphone, get the right interface, you know, and, and, you, and you're, you, you shouldn't need to do much more than that. No, absolutely. Okay, here we go. Um, something that I know Shaw do a lot on. Um, are wireless mics suitable for podcasting? Mm -hmm. Uh, very good question. Yes, they are. And there are a number of advantages, actually, to, to using wireless systems. One that's coming up more and more, actually, is using Lavalier microphones for podcasting, mm, yeah. which sounds kind of, you know, when this first comes up, I don't know, people kind of think it sounds weird, but then bear in mind, this is how broadcast news has worked for years, right? So the presenters have got Lavalier clip-on microphones on them with a wireless pack, and it works super well. Some things to watch out for, you will want to look at a digital wireless system for this. And the reason for that is a digital wireless system captures all of the audio really, really nicely, sends it over the air, and then demodulates it back into audio. Cheaper analog systems, we have to do a bit more processing with in order to get that to work. And specifically, there's a device called a Companda. And I'll, there's a whole other thing to talk about with that. But basically, what that does is compress the audio really, really heavily and allows us to send it analog over the airwaves and then expands at the other end. And we lose tons. They don't sound great. So I would not recommend that. Get something digital. Um, and, you know, when it comes to should I use a wireless system, the only question that I would ask kind of back is, what problem are you trying to solve by having it wireless? But we did have a situation recently with a very well-known podcast that is using SM7Bs, and they said that the problem with them is they're very big. And when they have guests come on to do the podcast, you know, they're very aware that they're talking into an SM7B and it kind of changes the nature of the conversation. And they wanted to get rid of them and make it like you're just sitting down having a chat with a mate. And wireless microphones with Aveliers ended up being a really good option for, for them to look into. Funnily enough, just to complete that story, they did end up going back to the SM7Bs because they said that they just sounded way, way better, which is quite funny. So, you know, we tried, but <laughs> SM7s were the one in the end. <laughs> <laughs> just to expand on that we've had another question come in i'm afraid i'm going to cut the queue guys and just tag this on the end of there without going into it too much because maybe this is a question for another webinar mm. um, but can you just briefly summarize do you need a radio license in order to use those wireless mics and can digital wireless mics introduce delays if you can just Ooh. okay back sure. through that one in a sort of nice little compact fashion <laughs> succinct uh, succinctly done uh it, so do I need a license? It depends. If you buy what's known as a 2.4 gigahertz wireless system, in sure, this used to be called uh, GLXD. Uh, there are other manufacturers that make 2.4 gigahertz wireless systems. These do not need a license because they work in the Wi-Fi spectrum, which is really, really good. So if you only need two channels, they're brilliant. If you need any more than that, if you need sort of five or six channels, there's not enough space and it's not going to work for you. You will need to look at a what we call UHF based microphone, which is we have a lot more control over and we can you know have specific frequencies. And in that space, you do need to license. Um, we can help out with that. I'm sure Studio Spares can also help out with that if you've got some more questions. The second question was, do they introduce delay? And the answer to that question is yes. Processing that audio, you know, we've got an A to D and then a D to A converter, and that process takes time. The more expensive the system, the less latency that there is going to be. Again, there's lots of really cheap digital wireless systems out there that are good, but they do have a degree of latency that you need to bear in mind. Uh, you know, nominally all the stuff that Shaw manufacture that's digital like SLXD for example the latency is really small I mean we're talking like three milliseconds which is absolutely acceptable 
Um, so yeah, that's where I would recommend that you look. It's an SLXD system in the UHF bandwidth, channel 38, really easy to license. Studio spares can, can talk you through that and make it sound really good. Yeah, we um, so we will be sending out an email tomorrow to everyone that's been on the webinar. Um, we've actually got a great blog post um, on our site that just gives a bit of a sort of uh, an overview of wireless and sort of an introduction to that. So I'll make sure we include that in the send as well. Um, and, you know, maybe the wonderful guys that Sean and Jack will come back again and do something on wireless systems. But we'll see how we go with that. Um, so <laughs> I've just got time for a couple more, I think, because I'm very conscious about time. Um, so a few of these questions we kind of answered ourselves um, through other other little bits. Um, OK, here's one about the SM7B. Pop filter on or pop filter off? Uh, pop filter on, probably for podcasting. Um, you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference because the actual diaphragm of the SM7B is set quite far back. Uh, there's also two different pop filters, right? So you've got the small one that you're using. There's also a bigger, a bigger version which you can put on. Uh, these are just specific use case things. If you're using a lot of gain in the system, like if you've got the SM7B with a really nice preamp and you're kind of really driving it, pop filter does help just bring those plosives down. And all that's going to do is mean you have to do less compression in your processing. You know, So I would always say put them on. There's nothing wrong with them. They don't attenuate the sound in any way. There was a really weird thing going around of using an SM7B pop filter on an NV7 microphone. I think somebody on YouTube did a video on it. Um, and I don't know, I kind of have my thoughts and opinions about how effective that's going to be. Some of my short colleagues are like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. It does fall into that kind of category of things that you can think about too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I wouldn't worry too much about that. If you happen to have one, give it a go. Let me know how it sounds. Um, but yes, pop filter on, uh, because why wouldn't you? Brilliant. Um, okay. And one last question um, we're here from, from David. It's... Um, do you really, uh, sorry, does it really make sense to use a compressor for sp for the speech of a podcast? Now, I'm not too sure necessarily sort of the angle of this question, but do you just go a little bit into the importance of compression and, you know, and processing or not processing if you don't think it's important? I know you mentioned it in, in your presentation, but sort of how, it, how the pros and cons, I guess. So you don't need to by any stretch. There's, there's tons of really good podcasts that do very little processing at all. Um, but, you know, how important is it to use compression? I mean, compression is in pretty much everything that, you know, that's doing stuff automatically. So Zoom that we're using for now, for example, has some processing built into it. And it'll be doing quite a lot of compression as, as a part of that. And the reason why it's important is, you know, as I kind of explained in the presentation, our brains are doing it anyway, right? Our brains have compressors built into them and we are processing all the audio that we hear. And it's really easy for us to do that when we're all in the same room and we're listening to audio that's out of our faces because that's what they're designed to do. It turns out if it's recorded audio or amplified audio or reinforced audio, our brains have to work really, really, really hard in order to compress that down. There's been some really interesting studies done in America about this. And that's why compression is super important. You don't want your listeners to get tired and get audio fatigue listening to your podcast. You want to make it nice and easy for them to sit down and relax and, and listen to on whatever they're doing. So that's why a little bit of compression is definitely recommended. If you don't want to get into the whys and wherefores of, of how to use the compressors, as Rob kind of said, use an auto compressor. There's tons of them available, tons of plugins, and the MV7 has one built in and you don't have to do anything with it. So it's a really easy thing to introduce, but it will make your audio sound more professional. And that's the secret source when it comes to getting that really nice BBC Radio 4 kind of close news type vocal that super professional radio sound, all of that is done by dialing in a compressor at exactly the right rate. So I would definitely recommend it as something to, to look at. Yeah, absolutely. I remember, I can't remember exactly what the podcast is, but it was when it was sort of really, really sort of starting to get quite sort of mainstream big and the podcast that I really loved and the content was great, but the audio was just, it was so difficult to listen to and just so harsh on my ears that I started to think, you start to think, do I actually like this podcast or like this? And it, you know, it's all these things, better audio and better microphones and processing. No, they don't make your podcast better, but if they, if, if you can make the experience for your listener as, as good as possible, that's, that's good, definitely going to go a long way. Definitely. And again, you don't have to do too much work. Like I, yeah. there's, there's a misinformation out there that you have to really work hard to get some really, really simple settings and then just leave it. You don't have to have golden ears. 
You don't have to have, like, you don't have to be a tonmeister, nothing like that. Anyone can do this. It's super straightforward. Um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And again, guys, any questions about gear, podcasting, anything audio-based, just get in touch with us at sales at studiospares.com or give us a call and one of our wonderful team members will be able to help you and hopefully give you all the answers that you need. Um, so that's just about all the time we have for the questions, I'm afraid, guys. But if there's anything that you've missed or you suddenly thought, ah, oh, I wish I'd asked that, drop us an email, we'll get it to Jack or we'll answer it ourselves and we'll, we'll just make sure we get that question sorted for you. I will, um, I'm also like, I'm, I'm always available on Instagram. Weirdly, that seems to be the best platform. So if you want to uh, DM me a question, please feel free to do so. My Instagram is jack.drury3. I'm the third Jack Drury on Instagram. <laughs> Excellent stuff. I hope that I hope Jack Drury one and two don't also work at short. Well, no, no, they they had to they had to leave when I joined. Um, so we're going to pick our winner now. Um, Mike has just picked that and he's sending it through to me. So one lucky winner tonight is going to win uh, a short SMV seven. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so guys, can you please? Down the bottom of the Zoom webinar, there's a little raise hand function. If you can press that and we can just see who's still here, who's engaging, who's run off to make a cup of tea and then coming back. If you raise your hand, we're going to pick a winner. Um, so we've got a short MV7 microphone as we've been talking about all night. Hopefully you can see that. Um, as Jack said, these are wonderful microphones. They, they do a lot of the hard work for you. Um, so I'm using mine well. now. There we go. Um, so, you know, it's it's a wonderful little, little product to win and you know, we love doing these little giveaways and this is definitely one of the, the best ones that we've done so far. So you've got one very lucky winner who is Karen Newton. So Karen, um, don't need to leave your email or anything like that. We've, we've got it all from when you signed up. So we will be in touch tomorrow to arrange getting your wonderful prize to you. Um, but everyone else that's on the webinar, fret not, you can still get something out of this beyond the wonderful presentation that Jack has given. Um, so we are offering 50% off isocubes, um, which is a basically a sort of, a, I guess, an introduction, a beginner's sort of area of acoustic treatment. It's a, a pop filter vocal isolator that works over the top of your condenser microphones to cut out some of those nasty noises that you don't need. Um, so we're offering 50% off those with the code PODCAST50, and that'll be running for a week. So again, all this information will be in the email that you receive tomorrow. So don't worry about having to make notes of anything. But yeah, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure having you involved. And hopefully you will join us for the next webinar, which we'll be announcing soon. But Jack, thank you very much. I hope you've That's enjoyed been great. as much yeah, as we have. Absolutely. And please do have us back. I'd love to uh, yeah, be on another webinar fairly soon. <laughs> absolutely. Well, we've got that on video now, so we'll have to hold you to that one, please. But um, yeah, we'll be in touch. And guys, hopefully we'll see you all on the next one. And we'll email you tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you so much for joining us. If you've got any questions, hit us up at sales at studiospares.com or through the website, which is studiospares.com. Good night.